This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Thank you everyone for coming today. It's great to see everybody. Um, as you know, this uh, talk is in conjunction with the rollout of our new Masters in European Union Studies. That is certainly the only such MA degree in the Western Hemisphere, and we believe it is the only such MA degree outside of the European Union itself. Uh, none of us read Chinese or Korean, so we haven't been able to double check that in some countries. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Professor uh, Andy Moravchik. Um, my preference is for short uh, introductions, and I hope that'll be short. If I gave the long one, uh, we wouldn't leave any time for him to speak. Um, he's a very eminent professor currently at uh, Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School, where he's also professor of politics. He's the founding director of the European Union program at Princeton. He was previously at Harvard, where he was the founding director of the European Union program at Harvard, too. Uh, so he has two-thirds of a hat trick, uh, and we'll all look forward to where he founds the next European Union program. Uh, he earned his PhD from Harvard in 1992 and was a professor at Harvard from 92 to 2004. Um, he has offered over, authored over 100 scholarly publications on a variety of topics, um, most notably European integration, transatlantic relations, international organizations, uh, democratic legitimacy of multilateral institutions, and global human rights. He made the first of many big splashes with his book, The Choice for Europe. Uh, my own copy of that book um, has 150 pages that are upside down and read right to left. So it's actually a collector's edition, uh, and I'll be accepting bids on that edition um, if, for, if anyone thinks. I'm sure it's, it's like these postage stamps that are printed upside down. I'm sure it's got to be worth something. Um, we're in the middle of doing uh, preliminary examinations for graduate students, and uh, I've been reminded lately, as if I needed reminding before, uh, that that book's made a seminal contribution to which many of our graduate students and, of course, active scholars make continual reference. Um, his current research focuses on a similar set of issues. Um, including, of course, European integration, international relations theory, um, methods, and Asian regional cooperation, um, which was reflected in a leave that he took in Shanghai in the academic year 2007-2008. He's also working on a project uh, related to opera, which is a wonderful um, disciplinary trespassing exercise that I, of which I heartily approve. Um, he makes a point out of reaching non-academic audiences as well as academic audiences. So he's a contributing editor to Newsweek magazine. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's published over 100 commentaries and policy analyses in all the big places, uh, Financial Times, Prospect, Foreign Affairs, and elsewhere. He's also the book review for Europe Free Foreign Affairs magazine. In addition to that, um, he's uh, doing, he does policy uh, relevant work of various kinds, and then that includes work on three continents. He's served uh, as a trade negotiator for the U.S. government, a special assistant for the Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea, editor of a Washington-based foreign pro policy journal, assistant in the press office of U the European Commission, and in various other policy-related positions. So in short, he's a very eminent and influential scholar, teacher, and public intellectual, and we are very happy to have Andrew Moravchek with us today. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks very much for the generous introduction. I'd like to encourage you next time to buy your edition of my book, not in China, but in the United States. Maybe the pages will be the uh, right way up. Um, and uh, thanks very much, uh, particularly to Laura Hastings and Wolfgang Schler, my friends here, uh, for, for having me. And particular greetings. I understand there's a group of people in 
Uh, Vienna, I was very impressed to see that uh, you have an active program there, watching by some miracle of uh, video transmission here, so viele Grüße there uh, in uh, Vienna. Um, I, I'd like to address today uh, um, an issue that I think is on everybody's mind um, as we think about where the international system is going, and that is the issue of the relative power of nations. Um, because I think when we reflect on what the influence of the United States is going to be and, and other countries, um, we pose this question practically every day in the headlines of what the geopolitical balance of power, as it were, is going to look like in the 21st century. And when we look at those headlines, we almost always see the same answer staring back at us, and that is that the two superpowers in the 21st century are going to be the United States and China. Or sometimes we read they're going to be the United States, China, and India. And this is based on the belief, um, that it, not, not false, that, that Asia um, is rising, and the implicit belief, although people don't say this as often, that Europe um, is in decline. Um, it's in decline because of economic sluggishness, demographic lethargy, military weakness, um, political disunity. Um, and in fact, many studies suggest that um, the, uh, Europe faces a demographic collapse, uh, that its economy is growing more slowly uh, than other parts uh, of the world. Uh, many people argue that, and yes, Europe can coalesce into something really resembling a nation state at the same scale as the United States or China, that it's headed for the dustbin uh, of history. And recent events, um, its inability to face down the United States in the case of the Iraq War, um, and uh, recent travails over European constitutions seem to suggest um, that this is true. Uh, I want to argue something quite different. I want to argue that Europe is the second superpower of the 21st century, certainly for the next generation or two, that it has uh, resources of global and regional influence far beyond China, those of China or India. It's the only other part of the world that really has the global reach and influence similar to those of the United States. Um, and in support of that thesis, I don't just want to cite statistics about policy and economic growth and such and talk about current day policy, but I also want to advance something of a theoretical argument, always a risky thing in a big audience, a theoretical uh, argument about the nature of power in the international system today, because I think the argument that Europe is headed for the dustbin of history and China is the superpower of the 21st century is based on a misunderstanding about what modern international power is. It's based on a 19th century view of power that associates power with a large population, a large aggregate GNP, and implicitly military power that comes from mobilizing those things. Um, this view in, in, in political science um, is viewed as a broadly realist theory of international politics. I think the theory is wrong and therefore the policy prescription is wrong. Nonetheless, this is broadly how Europe is viewed, not just in Washington and Beijing, but interestingly enough, even in Brussels by Europeans um, themselves. In fact, it is realists uh, that took the lead in advancing the view that Europe is in decline. People, for those of you who follow political scientists, science like John Mearsheimer, or Kenneth Waltz, uh, Stephen Walt, Charles Kupchin, and they argued shortly after the Cold War, and they've argued since, um, that Europe was in terminal decline. And what was the argument they made? They argued that in order to be an influential country or region in international affairs, you need to have uh, a lot of coercive 
power resources. Why coercive power resources, military power resources? Why? Because in this view, the realist view of the world, countries are essentially engaged in zero-sum conflict. Uh, and in order to prevail in that conflict, uh, they need to have military power and other means of power, say economic power, that they can use to coerce or induce other countries to do as they wish. They think, therefore, in balance of power terms about how you get what you want in traditional realpolitik terms. And you need to have a large concentration of power, therefore, of this kind, to balance against opposing concentrations of power and to avoid the possibility that others will extract concessions from you. The view of these people was, therefore, that, it, that at the end of the Cold War, what was going to happen was that European countries and the United States would have a falling out. Why did they believe this? Because the balance of power logic that kept them together, their common opposition to the Soviet Union, had disappeared. That Europe would fall apart into its zero-sum squabbles, that the United States and Europe would increasingly squabble with each other, and that we would see the rise of other countries like China. Indeed, some have gone so far, like David Schomburg, as to argue that it was logical to see a Euro-Chinese balancing alliance against the unipolar United States. This is the way realists think about the problem. An assumption of zero-sum conflict, a belief that the way, the way you get what you want is by extracting resources from your society, using them in an essentially coercive way. And that the way to prevail in these kind of conflicts is to be unified, resolute, to have military force as a tool at your disposal. Realists uh, rarely have such a clear set of predictions been set forth about what was going to happen, and rarely have they been so clearly disconfirmed. Um, in fact, what happened was not that America and Europe had a falling out. Despite, uh, with the exception of the single disagreement over the Iraq conflict, in fact, Europe and the United States have agreed on every single use of force since the end of the Cold War. Uh, the United Europe ha European integration has continued unabated. Europe has expanded from 15 to 27 countries. It went ahead and created a single currency. It eliminated border frontiers among European countries. It completed its single market. It moved uh, toward a common foreign policy. It promulgated a constitution. And for all the criticism of details of that or a failure to go as far as some idealists wanted, Europe remains the example, the sterling example, of the most successful international cooperation in world history. Europe has established itself as the world's second military power. It has 50 to 100,000 combat troops active outside of home territory in the world today, in places like Afghanistan, where Europeans constitute 33% of casualties, deaths to date, defending Afghanistan, in Iraq, in European-led operations in places like Lebanon or Chad or Sierra Leone. And it has quite a number, as I will go into in a minute, of civilian-led, uh, civilian policies from expansion of the European Union to trade policies uh, that are extremely effective. The world is, in fact, uh, bipolar, but more importantly, Europe is more unified and more closely collaborating with the United States than ever. So the realist prediction that the world would become more uh, conflictual and that cooperation would decline did not come about. And the question then is why? And that will take us back to the issue of why Europe can be thought of as more powerful and more influential than a country like China. And the answer is to think about a different kind of theory. 
kind of theory that international relations theorists think of as liberal theory, or theory that stresses not so much how much coercive power resources a country has, not a 19th century theory of power balancing, but a 21st century theory that stresses instead the interests that states have. Liberals argue that as states become more democratic, more interdependent, more committed to secular values uh, of welfare maximization for their population, even in places like China, there has been a decrease in underlying conflict throughout the world. And that increase in positive sum conflict means that we cannot assume that the kind of influence in the world that gets countries what they want is military force or that conflict is zero sum. Instead, countries have a wide range of opportunities and instruments of international influence. They're unlikely uh, to engage in zero sum conflict, but instead will need to use non-military and civilian instruments to get what they want. Trade policy, uh, international organizations, international law, and most of the, those kinds of instruments of international influence will involve reciprocal agreements and arrangements between countries that are mutually beneficial. So the question that liberals will ask about the post-Cold War period and about who has power in the world is what country or region is best situated to make deals with other countries to further its interests, not who is, as you would in the 19th century, who is best situated to benefit uh, from zero-sum conflict. And if you ask the question that way, then it's clear that Europe is the second superpower of the 21st century. Now, I've already mentioned briefly that even, this is just a parenthesis before we get into that, briefly, that even if we were to take a classic military uh, account, that Europe is vastly underestimated as a world power. Today, Europe accounts for 21% of global military spending. China accounts for 5%, Russia for 3 India for 2 Brazil for 1.5. Their forces are among the best equipped in the world using domestic production. Taken together, France and Britain spend 60% more on defense than China. They have a long-range nuclear arsenal substantially larger than China or any other third country. And as I said, Europeans don't just use these forces, don't just have these forces, they use them. There are 50 to 100,000 European combat troops active in the world today. China has 2,120 outside of its own uh, borders. No region or country, save the United States, possesses capabilities to project military force outside of its own borders, save the United States, and none is likely to soon. Uh, there's been uh, rumblings about a Chinese blue water uh, navy, uh, but Chinese power remains focused on and largely limited to the difficult task of projecting power a few hundred miles offshore in the eventuality of a Taiwanese crisis or protecting sea lanes in its immediate uh, proximity or a defensive crisis vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. The last major war China fought with another power, Vietnam, it lost. And uh, recent studies suggest that it is some doubt whether it would even win a confrontation with Taiwan if the United States did not intervene. Um, at best, such capacities are roughly on the scale of one or two Europe single European countries. They won't be able to compete with the European continent as a whole for a long time. But despite these military assets, that's not the core of the matter. Because Europe is the world's second military power, but it's the Euro world's preeminent civilian power. And this is really where I want to base our investigation because it is civilian power, not military power, that is going to drive international relations in the 21st century. 
economic influence, international law, smart power, soft power, instruments that can be wielded without massive destruction. It's much more cost effective to get your way that way than uh, through military intervention. What are these instruments that Europe has that other countries lack? The most single, the single most cost effective instrument that Europe has and powerful instrument is enlargement of the European Union. Accession to the EU is the single most powerful policy instrument that any Western country has wielded since the end of the Cold War. Twelve countries have entered into the European Union since the end of the Cold War, and Europe's power of attraction has helped to stabilize democracy, free markets, um, legal uh, rule of law in, in those countries. There's substantial evidence that enlargement creates a focal point in a set of incentives which stabilize domestic country politics in countries that could otherwise become wellsprings of nationalism and expansion. Countries like Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, Macedonia, even Turkey. European leaders continue to pursue enlargement in a very enlightened way, even in the face of considerable public opinion opposition. Europe also pursues an active neighborhood policy outside of those countries that could be considered reasonable possibilities for uh, enlargement. Countries like, uh, or very distant possibilities for enlargement. Countries like Morocco or Libya. Morocco is practically, from a policy point of view, a de facto member of the EU in many respects. A free trade area, uh, recently signed a treaty agreeing to create a status in economic law as if it were a member of the EU. The EU has been very involved in uh, human rights enforcement in Morocco. And the slow, quiet evolution of Moroccan politics is in part a function of that EU um, uh, in involvement. Same could be said of Moldova, Ukraine, Albania, other countries that are far as yet from EU membership. European governments are the strongest and most consistent supporters of international law and institution. They fund more than two-fifths of UN peacekeeping, about a half of all contributions to UN funds. Um, you look at any major international initiative, the Landmines Treaty, the ICC, anything like that, you'll find united or almost united European support behind them. Then you get to trade, investment, and finance. The EU is unquestionably a global and united superpower, larger than the United States, in all matters of trade and finance. It negotiates as a bloc in the WTO. It's a larger trading partner with China than the United States. It's the largest trading partner of every country in the Middle East, every country in the former Soviet Union bloc in the western portion, um, and it is uh, the United States' largest trading partner in, by sophisticated measure. Now, this is very important. You'll often read in the paper that trade statistics are, shape, are switching toward the Pacific, but trade, crude trade statistics, are no longer the real measure of what's going on in the world economy. Look at investment. Look at R&D. Look at intra-firm transactions, and you'll see that Europe still accounts for 50 or European American and European American Japanese interactions still account for 50 or 60 percent of economic activity in the world economy. The EU's common currency, the euro, is the only serious alternative to the dollar uh, as a reserve currency and a transaction currency, although it won't supplant the dollar anytime soon because of the first mover advantages of the dollar in US financial markets. It's still true that 32% of international debt securities and 38% of foreign exchange transactions are denominated in euros. Aid. The EU member states uh, dispense 50 to 60% of the foreign aid in the world today. Uh, and then there's the question of political and social values. Global polling and the practice of government suggest that it is values closer to those of European governments rather than the United States that are 
uh, that countries emulate throughout the world. How do we know that? We can look at the kind of constitutions that new democracies crafted in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, we can look uh, at the polling uh, of what new citizens in new democracies think of as admirable democratic practices. And if you do that, what you find, even in countries, say the countries of Eastern Europe, that are often thought of as reflexively pro-American, what you find is that European institutions, as opposed to American ones, institutions like parliamentary government, uh, generous social welfare, restrictions on money in politics, something very uh, striking this week, um, and uh, an international, rather than a quirkily national conception of what human rights are, um, poll very well throughout the world and are incorporated in national constitutions uh, as opposed to their American equivalents. All these things are real modes of global influence. And they're modes of global influence uh, that are particularly appropriate to the 21st century. Indeed, we could say that European influence is on the rise because each of these modes of influence, trade, uh, aid, European enlargement, the spread of values, multilateral organizations, is a mode of influence. Even the softer forms of military force that Europeans specialize in, like peacekeeping, studies show that UN and EU peacekeeping is more effective than American uh, peacekeeping. Even all these modes of influence will become more appropriate in a world such as the emerging world of the 21st century, where war, civil war and interstate war, is becoming less and less common. And interstate transactions short of war, and particularly these mutually beneficial deals, are becoming more and more common. War is becoming, this is a statistical commonplace of political science, less and less common. And there are various reasons within this um, context why Europe's power should be thought of as rising. And let me list a few of them. The first is that demographic and economic measures, those crude measures that we talked about at the start, of European decline are exaggerated. Even if we were to take the good old fashioned 19th century conception of power, power is how big is your economy and how many people do you have? Suppose we thought even these civilian measures of power are ultimately a function of how much GDP and population you have. As we'll see, it isn't true, but suppose we thought it was for a second. Um, even so, the most dire demographic and economic prognoses, you know, let's just extrapolate Chinese growth out, extrapolate European growth, only see Europe's share of global GDP declining from 22 to 17 percent over the next 50 years. Um, that's not a tremendous decline. Um, or to cite another statistic, um, if Chinese increases in military spending and current rates of military spending increase unabated at current rates, no scare scenarios about economic crisis or environmental crisis in China, just continue extrapolation of current trends. Pan-Asian defense spending, the defense spending of every Asian country added together will only surpass American defense spending in the year 2070. That's how long it will take for any kind of transition to take place. And the Europeans are up there alongside Americans. So it's a very, very long time uh, before there'll be any kind of fundamental change. But the more fundamental reason, and this is the reason that relates to the theoretical discussion I raised at the start, the more fundamental reason why Europe is well placed in the coming century is because GNP and population are crude and misleading measures of the ability to wield this kind of new civilian power and influence. There is no linear relationship between 
population and GDP and smart or um, uh, civilian power. Territory and population in the old days translated into influence because you use territory and population to extract resources and military manpower. And you converted that into military forces and you marched out and did things. So you think about Russia, right? There's your classic example. Or the United States, right? But nowadays, what do you need in order to have a highly sophisticated trading economy or an economy that can uh, give foreign aid? Um, it's not de demography. It's high per capita income. It's the high per capita income countries that are capable uh, of projecting power in this way. Uh, and there's a very important reason for this. Um, projection of power in the modern world has become a luxury good. In the old days of zero-sum military conflict, you had to have an army at the ready. You had to extract those resources because you were stuck in a zero-sum conflict with other countries. If you didn't do so, you might be overrun. Nowadays, engaging in conflict abroad is most of the time a luxury for countries. Going and getting involved in humanitarian conflicts abroad or something is uh, something that beyond a minimal level is a luxury. It's something that high per capita income countries can do, but most countries uh, cannot. A country like China is in a situation where it would in fact be more capable internationally if it had less population. Why? Well, because 300 million Chinese have, relatively speaking, high per capita income, but the other one billion do not. And the number one concern of any Chinese leader, and if you live in China, this becomes clear very quickly, the number one concern of any Chinese leader is to maintain the legitimacy of the regime by maintaining economic growth and making sure that there's a spread of wealth to the Chinese population. The Chinese government cannot afford either to divert large amounts of resources to international adventurism or can it afford the disruption that international warfare or international crisis would cause. That's why the Chinese government is so cautious and mature in its attitude toward resolution of the Taiwan conflict. That's why Beijing spends so little as a percentage of GDP on military spending. The Soviet Union used to spend 15 or 18 percent. China spends one or two. That's because they have more important fish to fry because any po politician's legitimacy, indeed the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party depends on maintaining the current model. This is not really my argument as much as the argument of Susan Shirk in a book called China Fragile Superpower, which I'd recommend to you. She makes the argument that it's really domestic stability in China that's primary and drives uh, this uh, Chinese foreign policy. So the critical factor in measuring global influence then is high per capita income. And it will take a very, very long time for Asian countries to catch up with levels of per capita income which permit countries to engage in the relatively luxurious um, act of projecting global influence or simply engage in the sophisticated transactions high foreign direct investment, foreign aid, uh, supporting international organizations that permit that, that sort of influence to be projected. The third and most important reason why the conventional view of European and demographic and economic decline is misleading um, is because in many ways outcomes in international relations today are completely unrelated to any kind of material power resources at all, neither to aggregate GNP or even to per capita GNP. Instead, they're a function of the extent to which there is material and ideological conflict of interest with other countries. That is to say, the moment you move from a world in which there is zero-sum conflict and countries resolve it by warfare to a world in which 
countries make deals and get what they want by making deals, the question you have to ask yourself is, how many people are there with interests like mine with whom I can make deals? And if you're Europe, you're set. You've got 26 other countries around you who you've been making deals with for 50 years and you're very successful doing it. You've got a lot of countries in your neighborhood who think like you and you can make more deals. And you get along really well with the United States and Japan, whom you can make even more deals with. And those countries together total about 75% of the global economy right there. Right? And that is going to be true for quite a long period of time. Europe has a tremendous advantage in that its own region has been pacified. You know, the Yugoslav wars are now almost 20 years back. Um, so it has very little to worry about in its own neighborhood. It doesn't have any fundamental squabbles with the United States or any other global superpower. Right? It has very little to worry about. China, by contrast, is in a somewhat rougher neighborhood, um, has some unresolved uh, difficulties. Now, I have to say, I'm an optimist about China. I think China has pursued a very mature, very sensible policy. It's resolved most of its own border disputes. I think things look relatively good. But what defense spending there is in China is largely spoken for. Has to worry about potential Taiwan conflict. Potentially has to worry about something like India. Potentially something like Russia. I mean, at least a prudent Chinese defense planner would be thinking about that. Europe has military resources, civilian resources, and it basically doesn't have to worry about any threat at all. Which means, again, it can expend those, good, those resources as a luxury good doing what it wants throughout the world. It has a quiet region. What's more, the social evolution of the world is, broadly speaking, in a European direction. Now, this is a more controversial point. Some people believe the world is moving in a Chinese direction. We'll see more authoritarian capitalist states. So it's controversial. But certainly, it's arguable that the world will move in a direction that is more democratic, a direction that is more capitalist, in a direction that is more developed, in a, question, in a direction ultimately that's more social democratic. And if it moves in that direction, Europe will be very well placed. Um, as I pointed out, it is striking that relations between the United States and Europe um, are so much better than they were during the Cold War. Again, this is a matter that is a striking uh, anomaly or a striking problem for people who think about the world uh, from a realist point of view. From a realist point of view or from a traditional balance of power point of view, the conventional view would be, and this is often the story you hear, that America and Europe got along great during the Cold War because we had a common enemy. And we opposed that common enemy. Um, and whatever differences we had, we resolved them uh, in the interest of opposing the Soviet Union. Then, after the Cold War, uh, things tended to fall apart. Uh, we didn't get along. Uh, as well. That's what balance of power theory predicts, and that's what many people believe happened. But in fact, the truth is exactly the opposite. During the Cold War, we got along in Europe with the Europeans, but Americans and Europeans agreed about almost no use of force outside of Europe. After the Korean War, you can think about perhaps the intervention in Lebanon or Congo as points of agreement. Almost every other use of force outside of Europe, Europeans and Americans were on opposite sides, often strikingly on opposite sides. Europeans opposed the United States in Vietnam after the very start. Um, when the Americans, for example, bombed Libya from the only country, Reagan in 1986 bombed Libya from the only country in Europe that would let us uh, let the F-111s take off, which was Britain, they polled the British the next day and asked them, what percentage of you think that the presence of American bombers on British soil increases the security of the British nation? 4% said yes. 4%. Right? That's how bad it was back then. In Latin America, in Africa, Europeans were funding people who were shooting at people who were funded by the Americans, right? I mean, there was a complete, the United States cast 
Over 30 vetoes in the United Nations about the Middle East alone, in the decades of the 1980s alone. There was complete disagreement between the Americans and the Europeans. As I said before, since 1989 and the fall of the wall, only the Iraq war is a case in which the Americans and the Europeans disagree about policy. Right? Exactly the opposite of what you would believe. So the Europeans, again, are sitting in a situation where they're broadly in agreement with the, the other superpower. Um, and this puts them in a position where their civilian assets and their secondary military assets are in a very, uh, uh, can be used uh, quite effectively. So the world um, is broadly bipolar today. This word political scientists use. There are two great, power, great superpowers, the United States and a more or less united uh, Europe. Other countries will take a generation, two, maybe three, to catch up. Their regional powers, you can think of China as being roughly on the scale of a single one, one and a half European countries. Has an export surplus, roughly the size of Germany. Has a nuclear arsenal, roughly the size of France. Has a power projection capability about 100 miles off its own border, right? So it's, a, it's like a Germany in Asia. That's the order of magnitude of what we're talking about. And it will be um, increasing in size, but very slowly for a period to come. And from that perspective, the broad discussion in the press about a G2 or about the fact that starting today, China and the US will be running uh, the world economy or the world polity is quite misplaced. Now this is not to deny that a number of other great powers, China and India among them, are also on the rise. Right? Now that might seem strange. So Europe's on the rise, the US is on the rise, some people say, but Europe's on the so I say Europe's on the rise, China's on the rise, India's on the rise. How can everybody be on the rise? Right? Aren't I contradicting myself? But no. If you're a realist, if you're one of those 19th century geopoliticians, if you're Bismarck, right, then maybe it's a contradiction because you're living in a zero-sum world, right? So if one country rises, the other has to fall. But we're not living in a 19th century world. We're living in a 21st century world, a world where interactions between countries are positive sum. So more than one country can rise at once because the influence of more than one country over its geopolitical environment can be increasing at the same time. European countries can expand and perfect a range of civilian instruments to influence their environment at the same time as the United States is emerging as a unipolar uh, global power and at the same time as China is increasing its role as a regional power. There's no contradiction between these things if the world is one in which countries are increasing their ability to control the consequences of international interdependence in different economic and security uh, and environmental issue areas. And that's exactly what's going on. But it's still true that China and India and other countries, will developing countries, will have to wait a generation or two or three before they have the sort of per capita income, convergence of preference, domestic institutions, and experience required to project power in the way that Europe and the United States can do so today. And when they get to that phase, we will probably worry about them a lot less than we do today. So you need to place the current evolution, it seems to me, in a theoretical context of social uh, evolution um, that, um, place, that, that leads us to understand this uh, correctly. There was a wonderful, a close with a wonderful anecdote that came up, I did a radio program, I guess some of you may have heard it, wonderful radio program you have here. Um, and uh, somebody called in and gave uh, one of those long questions. Um, and, uh, but they told a wonderful anecdote and I thought the anecdote 
um, kind of summarize the world we see emerging. They said, I'm paraphrasing, um, that, uh, well, the United States is leading an operation in Afghanistan these days, and the EU is involved funding civilian operations, and it's a NATO operation with European troops backing us up, from, and actually 22 other countries, um, and as I said, 33% of the uh, casualties, so a US-led operation with EU and NATO involvement, and one of the things they're defending is a Chinese mining corporation in Afghanistan. That's the modern world we're looking at, something very far from the zero-sum politics of the 19th century. Thank you. So I'm happy to take whatever questions you have. So why don't you tell me who you are and you know, what you do. Yeah. Student. Hello, student. OK. In any case, um, you did, of course, mention uh, income per capita as being a valuable number to determine how right. uh, the European Union is a monitor. Um, are there any other actual, uh, particular quantifiable, easily quantifiable things that you might point to uh, to be effective? For of course, unfortunately, the, uh, as you pointed out, our uh, 19th century idea of how things work actually is really easy to grab. Um, statistically speaking, it's really easy to capture these kinds of numbers. Unfortunately, though, as you point out, they're becoming less and less pertinent. Um, so what other types of numbers might we look to uh, in your estimation to try to affect this? Well, on the economic side, I'd refer you to the work uh, that comes out annually or some uh, biannually by Dan Hamilton at SICE, who does statistics on the transatlantic relationship and tries to uh, look at um, the economic relationship transatlantically, you could extend that also to Japan, but to get beyond trade statistics. So he believes, and I agree with that, that foreign direct investment, R&D, intra-firm trade is really what holds the international economy together. Um, rather than simply trade in goods. Um, that these are binding ties that are much more stable and reflect a much more uh, high intensity quality form of production. Um, it turns out that the level of um, you know, annual in American investment in Belgium alone is as high as it is in, in China. Um, because it's just an enormous amount of stock of investment and then flow um, in on the back of that. Um, so, you know, when you look at these more sophisticated forms of economic interchange rather than just crude trade, and you have to remember about, <clears throat> excuse me, Chinese trade that China is often the um, way station for the final production of goods that come instead from South Korea or from some other place and then come through China and come back out. So it's actually very hard to know um, what, uh, what that means. But even if it were true that, you know, Chinese exports were were uh, uh, a irrelevant number, let's remember that that number is roughly the same size as the export numbers from Germany. And we haven't been scared stiff about German exports any time I can remember recently, right? So uh, then I think the other number to keep in mind, the other kinds of numbers to keep in mind are things like um, educational numbers and things like that. So for example, Europe educates four times as many foreign students from outside the European Union as a whole, so third country students, um, as does the United States. Now, you can argue about the quality of the education, so whether or not America has some, you know, MIT and Princeton, I'd like to say, um, <laughs> University of Illinois, you know, high-end um, research universities that might in certain respects be stronger, but Europe does more than its share in educating students, particularly from some, you know, uh, areas of concern in the world like the Middle East. Um, so that's a very important um, function. And so I think what we need to do is measure these, the, the aspects of um, state activity that are proximate to these instruments of smart and soft power. And one of the things we're doing, um, doing in connection with Brookings is to come up with an index of transatlantic power capabilities, USEU, 
which is not you know, one-dimensional, how much do we spend on military, or two-dimensional, how much do we spend on military and foreign aid, which is the way you normally see the debate, but looks at all these different things. You know, how much are you doing on global warming? How, much do you, how many foreign students do you take? What do you do on you know, international organizations? Try to get a sense of everything countries do multidimensionally in the modern world to promote um, global peace and security. And I think that's the relevant kind of number. Well, um, if you can, I did write the book on it with some of the pages right side up, so that, that uh, about that. But um, uh, my own view about it is that countries are motivated by this is a controversial view. Other people disagree, right? But my view of it is countries are motivated largely by their interests and what they have to do. Europe was flat on its back, um, and um, it became in the post-war period. And it was not so much before, but it came in the post-war period, the world's most interdependent continent. Why? Because after the Second World War, trading patterns and patterns of economic activity in the world shifted from being north-south between countries and their colonies essentially trading um, raw materials for finished goods to basically north-north trading manufactured goods and services between countries. As that happened, it made Europe into a extraordinarily interdependent continent. A lot of small countries in very close geographical proximity trading what economists call intra-industry trade within the same sectors of the economy. That is extremely propitious um, configuration for trade liberalization, economic liberalization. It's a, it's a kind of situation where economic actors basically can't live without a certain amount of standardization and uh, regulation uh, in common. So it was inevitable that Europe was going to have to straighten that out, just as the United States and Canada, for example, have straightened it out. But the difference between the United States and Canada is there's the United States and Canada, right? So um, there are only two countries, and Canada sort of has no choice but to go along with what the United States wants to do to, to uh, direct itself to American norms. In Europe, you have for six, then nine, then 10, then 12, then 15, then 27 countries. And so they have to negotiate it amongst themselves. So my story is quite functional. Countries do what they have to do for largely, not entirely, but largely material reasons. Some people tell a more idealistic story about people having a European ideal in their mind. Um, and they accuse me of being cynical or skeptical or pessimistic by stressing interest. But my view is, I'm the optimist, because if you really believe that people just do these things, like form something like the European Union because they believe some European ideal, then the moment they stop believing it, like a bunch of right-wing anti-immigrant people you know, are there in Austria and they just say, you know, Europe is a pain because there are too many people from some other country, the game's up, right? But if you think, as I do, that European integration is hardwired into the structure of modern countries because they cannot survive economically or politically without it. Just as I think China made a choice that it would be extremely difficult for it to back away from. Then you think it's here to stay. And so I think in that respect, Europe is only an exaggerated version of what every country in the world, including ourselves, have to go through. Which is why it's great that you have a master's program here in European Union Studies, because it's the future. Yeah. Yes. Um, my name is Anna Stedford. I'm a professor of Scandinavian Studies and in the European Union Center here at Illinois. So I just have, um, if you could make a, a brief comment on how you see um, an example like the Copenhagen Climate Talks, for example. I'm, I'm interested and intrigued by the idea of, um, of the dynamics and so forth that you paint in terms of world politics. But could we argue that China is because it, at least in this instance, is portrayed so strongly as a 
I think China is one of the issues. Power is issue specific in this, in my account of it. So if, if you believe that power is not a function of having a lot of military resources and just using it, but instead is a function of what deals you can make, it follows that it's issue specific, right? The deal you can make in global warming is different than the deal you can make on trade. China joins the WTO, but doesn't join the Kyoto Protocol or whatever deal is going to be made at Copenhagen. Might be quite different than, say, human rights, where China says, well, not now, right? So um, therefore, um, is that my phone? You interrupt your own talk with a phone. That's really. <laughs> Um, that's my son asking for the code to open up the TV. That's what I know. Um, so uh, not only that, his problem is that when he calls once, he calls twice. So, uh, um, so I think it is true that in the area of global warming, China is a, a very important global player. Although, although, again, think about its relative position, right? Europe could be a tremendously important global player. It's just as well behaved, right? So its relative power is enormous, but it has behaved itself. So its position in normal debates is, is quite positive. And it, it also will, has a tremendous amount of influence because if there's going to be a global warming deal, that's going to involve transfers from wealthy countries to developing countries. And those transfers are going to have to come from somewhere which is the United States and Europe. So um, you know, it's not to say that Europe is not influential, but I think it's true that China, by virtue of being an extremely polluting country, is an extremely influential country. There's, kind of an inf there's a quirky example that's a little like this, which is the United States is a big economic country, but its influence in the immediate post-war period um, in economic negotiations was exaggerated, not just by the fact that the United States was relatively healthy after the Second World War, but by the fact that it was an extremely protectionist country. And because it was an extremely protectionist country, it could lower its tariffs because it had been so badly behaved before. And this gave it a lot of influence because by lowering its tariffs, it could give away a lot. So countries that are badly behaved, like ourselves and the Chinese, can, can wield power by behaving themselves in negotiations. Yeah. I'm Catherine In, and I'm an econ student. And well, first of all, I would like to say that Chinese government would be love, like, would love it very much for you to become the speaker of their foreign policy, so that um, so the world won't be threatened by so-called the rising power. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you said about the um, becoming a superpower. Um, do you think Europe is ready to take back on the responsibilities of being a superpower? Because when you took out Rwanda and Congo, um, the ethnic problems right now could be rooted upon what um, back in the colonialism era and the imperialism era. And um, just for a little example, um, China has been building, helping to build railways and infrastructure since the 1960s in Africa. But some French and British companies in Africa would withheld their ownership on mining fields, not helping the local economy to build or given local jobs, but retain their ownership on the mines. Um, just, that's just a very small example. I would just like to ask, do you think um, Europe, after 100 years, maybe after 50 years of um, um, tossing away their imperialism policies, would they actually be pursuing the interest of other countries? Because if you pull a poll in Africa, I'm sure um, the Chinese government has a better image in Africa than the European countries. That's my question. Right. Um, well, it, the, um, the, it's certainly true that the um, bad image of the Europeans post-imperialist is deserved. Um, whether or not, given what the Europeans and the Chinese have done in the last 20 years, the Chinese deserve a better image is an open question, I think. Um, it's not clear, I, I think highly questionable, that um, the Chinese activities in Africa are either larger 
or more in the public interest than those pursued by Western governments. Western governments are engagement, particularly if you include private sector engagement, and most of what China is engaged in in, in Africa is quasi-private sector engagement. That is to say, it's engagement by state firms and state activity to back up the activity of state firms, that is to say, resource-producing firms, so that the Chinese state oil company could be thought of as the equivalent not of a development agency in the West, but of Exxon. Um, it, so that, that activity is both quantitatively much smaller and, to put it charitably, not obviously more in the public interest than the activity of American assistance agencies, European assistance agencies, and so on. One thing I agree with you about, I think people are on the Chinese, critical of China for um, being involved in Africa, um, signing resource deals. Um, my view is some of these resource deals are ill-advised from a Chinese standpoint, that is they're not cost effective, but that's their problem if they want to waste money. But, um, but that they're odd strikes me as a strange criticism coming from countries that have large oil companies that go and try to do similar deals, right? I mean, that's what everybody engages in these kind of resource politics. And the only thing that strikes me as sentimental is the claim that you sometimes hear that we could have regional cooperation in Asia around resources and things like that. I mean, that never happens, right? I mean, resource deals are large, lumpy, one-off, zero-sum transactions. It's a, it's a relatively conflictual type of international interaction. So I think there's an area, there's an issue area, since the world is issue-specific, where we should expect a little bit more competition, not necessarily zero-sum competition, but, but much more conflictual um, situation where countries will be competing against each other. That's the way the world is. Yeah? From France. Wait, wait for the, wait for the, uh, the microphone. Micro. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a law student and I'm coming from France, Evelyne. And I would like to know um, if uh, certain resources could have an influence in the balance of power. The what? Uh, no. Certain resources like water. Water. Yeah. Well, I suppose it could. Um, but, you know, can you name an example that you're thinking of? I don't know oh. Certain country can just owe the water and certain other lack of water, so it's a very simple question. <laughs> I mean, it's like Canada uh, would yeah. have a lot of water and California a lot. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think of that less as power than as a conflict over, source of conflict over resources. Yeah, I mean, people often think of, um, you know, a case that's more pertinent to Europe is, is resource battles with Russia. So you often hear this with regard to Russia. So does Russia have a stranglehold over Europe? Because it's pumping natural gas and so on into, or oil into, into, uh, into Europe. And is Europe threatened by this, right? Well, you know, there, there are various ways to think about this. I mean, there is between uh, Europe and Russia, a certain dependence by Europe on Russia, but there's a certain dependence of Russia on Europe. And in some, from certain points of view, the dependence, Russia's dependence is larger than the dependence by Europe. Um, so it's a, in fact, this relationship is interdependent, like most relationships in the global economy. And then, you know, for it to be a truly geopolitical power resource, you would have to imagine the Russians saying credibly, we're going to cut off your natural gas in exchange for a political concession. So we're upset about something you're doing in Moldova. We're going to cut off the natural gas. Well, how long are you going to do that? I mean, we're talking tens of billions of euros. You're just going to cut off an income stream to, to Russia? Is that worth it for the Russians, really? You know, I don't think so. 
There's not a lot of evidence there is, particularly where the Russians, Russia's run now, right? So, so you have to think through very carefully whether you think these are really credible scenarios. But even if you thought it was a credible scenario, there is a solution to the problem. The solution is not a 19th century solution. The solution is a 21st century solution. The 19th century solution is you get out your army or you threaten and you march over to the Russian border or you get out, uh, you threaten a sanctions against Russia, you know, mano a mano, right? The 21st century solution is that you find a way of sharing energy resources within the European Union such that you mitigate the consequences of any such cutoff for a period of time so that you are less vulnerable to Russian pressure. Particularly, as has been true recently, individual countries are less vulnerable to Russian pressure. And that's exactly the policy that Europeans are trying to put in place, a civilian response to what maybe sometime in the future might be a geopolitical threat. Again, the technology for responding, the institutional technology for responding to these kind of geopolitical threats is not an old-fashioned technology, it's a newfangled technology. But the thing to remember is no country is good at this, right? In a certain sense, no country is more vulnerable than the United States, right? Here we are, the great superpower. The United States is highly energy dependent, has been complaining about this for 35 years, and can't do anything about it because it is extremely difficult for countries to free themselves from this kind of energy dependence, right? So to judge the European Union by whether or not it can free itself from something that no country seems to be able to free itself from would seem to be an extremely high standard. But can, can I just add something? Because uh, you, you speak about uh, energy, but water is more necessary, I mean, uh, concerning the question of living. I mean, because you can maybe just uh, deal for a while if Russia cut oil, but water, that could be maybe um, more problematic. Yeah, but the ca number of cases in the world where you can credibly cut off somebody's water supply is relatively few, right? Number of countries that are, as a country, vulnerable to cut off the water supply is, relatively speaking, few, right? I mean, there are a few cases in Africa, one or two cases in Asia is pretty much it, right? So from a European standpoint, I can't think of a country that's vulnerable to a cutoff of water supply. Yeah. Um, I have, my name is Richard Rennick. I'm a retired political scientist. Um, I'll, Must be I'll good just, life. I'll just address the issue of population. You've used the issue of demography only in the context of uh, standing armies and the like. But there are other issues, and one of which has to do with the, the market mm -hmm. uh, and GDP. So I was wondering what, given the projections that we have of population rates and declines in some areas that are fairly significant over the next several decades, um, what impact this might have on the economy, and also the extent to which European, the European Union might adjust this through immigration, and what issues immigration raises with respect to a number of issue, uh, problems, including local civilian authority. Uh, if certain communities, Muslims and so forth, refuse to acknowledge European common laws. Well, this is a big dilemma that, that European countries face. Um, as I said, I think the macroeconomic impact of this is exaggerated. Even if you continue to current trends, the, the, the dilemma is not as great as people make it out to be in gl global geopolitical terms. But as a domestic political uh, concern, and concern particularly about the future of the uh, stability of the social welfare state, so the kind of fiscal stability of current institutions in Europe, it's a major issue. Um, as it is for China in a slightly longer time span, which also has a demographic bubble, which is going to be a problem. So from a geopolitical standpoint, less of a problem because it doesn't change the relative standing of countries as much as one might think. But from a domestic standpoint, um, it is a concern. Now I think you know, the truth lies somewhere between extremes. There is a current of thought in the United States which is very extreme on this issue, which views um, 
Muslims as, as close to taking over Europe in a short time span and most of them as being extremists and um, incorrigible um, and, uh, and the um, posing a fundamental threat to um, Western values. And I, Christopher Caldwell is an example of this and I think that stuff is just empirically wrong based on most of the best political science we have. It's not a char good characteristic a characterization of of France or the Netherlands or most countries on which we have any reasonable data, let alone the countries that he doesn't talk about, like Germany, where you just don't have this same genre of problem at all. So um, uh, I think the view that you know Europe is on the edge of, of sort of falling out of the ambit of Western civilization, which is the way you read about it in some publications, is just uh, wrong. It's, however, true that um, the fear in many European publics that um, immigration is changing the basic identity of societies puts a limit on immigration, um, at least from those kind of societies, and it, it appears that immigration from due east, former Soviet or Soviet bloc countries, appears to be somewhat limited for a time being. So, um, you know, you're faced with a with somewhat of a constraint, and some people think a binding constraint on on growth. Um, in, the, in the short term, there seems to be more feasibility to expand immigration from the east than immigration from the south. So you should look in the short term toward um, uh, increases of that kind. And governments have a considerable flexibility to do that. So to give you an example, the British government famously let in lots of Poles after um, uh, Poland entered the European Union, declined to let in Bulgarians, now has been slowly increasing East European immigration again. So governments have some flexibility to manipulate this within certain public opinion constraints. So we'll see how it goes in the future. But this is a you know, central, central issue in European uh, domestic political management for the future. But again, of less geopolitical influence than, or impact than I think people make it out to be. Yeah. Uh, you, need a, you need a mic. Uh, you're mentioning that uh, wars are going to become less common because of the uh, development in the EU, but I was wondering how the Rothschild central banking dynasty will affect the EU in the future as far as wars. What Rothschild central banking dynasty? Uh, that's the dynasty that uh, run, does the central banking for uh, European Union. Uh, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be wonderful if central banking was such an interesting topic that we could um, study colorful people like the Rothschilds. In fact, I have a colleague, Harold James, who has written definitive books on uh, the great families of European central banking. But I'm sorry to report that one of the impacts of the centralization of central banking in the European Central Bank is it's been taken over by the most dreary of technocratic guys in Frankfurt. And I've spent some time with these people because my own view is that of the various institutions of the European Union, among those that work least satisfactorily is the European Central Bank, which current events in Greece, if you've been following that at all, um, attest to, which is that we have a central bank for all of Europe, but the political economies of the individual countries are quite disparate. The central bank suits, for political reasons in the past, suits Germany very well, but for countries that have a looser domestic regime that has tolerated more inflation and more fiscal looseness it doesn't suit Greece, Italy, some other countries very well. And the result is they're in serious uh, macroeconomic trouble. Um, and I can tell you that the Dewar fellows there in Frankfurt are a more humorless and colorless lot. Um, it cannot be imagined. From a research point of view, it'd be wonderful if there were Rothschilds uh, dressed in those wonderful 19th century costumes that I could. Um, indulge my passion for opera by discussing highfalutin things, but I'm sorry to report uh, that they're career bureaucrats um, of a, uh, you know, pretty boring type. 
Thank you. One more. Yes. From where? Denmark, from Copenhagen. Um, Great country, Denmark. Thank you. Uh, you make me even more proud by listening to, to all your praise to the European model. But, what but, but, yes, but. But. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what about the threat from within Europe? We have seen declining turnouts for elections for the European Union over the last uh, 20 years in Denmark. Uh, other countries uh, have similar trends. And in general, Brussels seems very, very disconnected from the people. And the people seems to be more disconnected from what the politics of their union is. Um, how will that look in the future? How, what, what do you project that that will turn out to be in the future? And, and will that be reflected in Europe as a superpower? Um, I have a strong opinion about this. Um, that opinion is there's no problem, and here's why. Um, it's true your participation rates in European elections have been going down. They've gotten so low, they're almost as low as American participation in congressional <laughs> elections, which is awful. Um, they're low by European standards because Europeans are generally participate more in elections. So you have to ask yourself, why are they so low as those American participation rates? Um, the answer is not, as it is not in the United States, because the fundamental institutions are illegitimate. Um, if you poll Europeans and you ask them, what political institutions in your life do you, it doesn't really matter how you phrase the question. As you know, in political science, it matters a lot how you phrase the question, but in this case, you can phrase it any way you want. Which institutions do you trust? Do you like? Do you want to have solve your problems? In fact, European Union institutions poll slightly higher than national institutions. And here's an interesting fact for those of you that are political scientists. It is by no means true that democratic, quote unquote, institutions, that is institutions in which we somehow participate, like parliaments, poll higher in general. People do not in general trust or want to delegate authority to institutions that are democratic in that sense, populist institutions. Um, so the whole premise of the question that Europe is unpopular and it's unpopular because people don't participate in it is wrong in both halves, right? It's wrong because Europe isn't, as far as we can tell, less popular than national governments. And it's wrong because even if it were, um, that wouldn't make it um, illegitimate in people's minds. And if, even if that were true, it wouldn't be because people weren't participating. So the whole premise of it is wrong. But you have to ask yourself, why don't people participate? Okay, and the answer is because the European Union doesn't do the kind of things that would induce people to participate. You have to think about this from the point of view of a voter. Your average voter is a pretty straightforward person. Um, they're interested in relatively few things, and those few things are more or less the same in most Western democracies. Taxing and spending, social welfare provision, health care, education, um, local infrastructure, law and order, right? The basic issues that you would be likely to go out and vote on, right? Not trade policy, monetary policy, the constitution of the Macedonian stabilization force, um, things like that, right? The things that the EU does. And you need a lot of political salience, as political scientists would call it, to get people to focus on an election. So if you do something like hold a referendum on the European Constitution in Ireland, as they recently did, and you force voters to go out there and confront an issue about which they do not care, what happens? You get chaos. It's bad enough in California, right, when you have referenda about issues that people kind of think they know something about, you know. It's, a lot of that behavior is random. And it's overwhelmed, most political scientists would tell you, by what's called the negative heuristic. That is, if you don't know, vote no. Right? But it's particularly bad in the European Union, where people have absolutely sure they don't know and don't care about what's going on. It can be shown that 80 to 90 percent of the people who voted in the Irish referendum on the Constitution voted no, not just on no issue that was in the Constitution itself, that was almost nobody, right? But no issue that had anything to do with Europe, right? They either voted on the, on the basis of things 
that were completely illusory, like the EU was going to, you know, uh, ban abortion, or local issues that they just were upset at the sitting government or something like that, right? When you force people to vote about things they don't care about, you get chaos. And then what happens is the next day, op-ed writers in the Financial Times say, aha, you see, the EU is unpopular, right? Although nobody cast a vote on anything like that basis. Usually they're concerned about things like third country immigration, and they blame it on the EU, although the EU doesn't have a third country immigration policy, right? So the EU has gotten a bad rap for its democratic legitimacy on the basis of next to no empirical data. And based on an extraordinarily naive conception of democracy, which is that people should be able to vote intelligently about anything, and when we see them vote intelligently about this, we should read the consequences. Yes, you don't like that. Because Denmark is different. <laughs> I'm half serious about that. And that's, that's essentially the problem uh, of why we can't ratify a European constitution and we will have this problem for years to come. I worked on a campaign this summer for the European Parliament elections, a social democratic campaign by the way, and um, we were running on a platform on the exact same issues as you mentioned that people would care for, but they didn't care. Of course. Okay, so the solution to that is take every opportunity you can to depoliticize. I know it sounds cynical, right? But it's the right thing to do. In fact, I would defend it on normative grounds, on political philosophy grounds, on democratic theory grounds. Depoliticize. It is an affront to democratic theory to force people to vote in an election only about issues about which they know and care, not at all. Okay? That, is a, that, that makes no sense, right? So you should try to depoliticize. But what did European leaders do in the last 10 years? They tried to politicize an issue, namely the European Constitution, a document that contained almost no content that any European cared about. Then they did the following. They said, it's a constitution, you should care about it. Well, Europeans said, well, it's a constitution, I should care about it, except I can't figure out what's in it that should matter. Maybe the politicians are lying to me. So then they voted against them. So then the Europeans said, okay, it's not a constitution. It's just a treaty. So then they said, wow, now they're really lying to me. Um, because they could see they hadn't changed the content. Now, in fact, the second time around, the politicians were telling the truth. It actually wasn't a constitution the first time. It was just a treaty. So now the politicians, having lied before, were telling the truth. But the, po the po population, having thought they were telling the truth, thought they were lying, right? And then, the, then it was hopeless from then on, right? All you could do is try to save it. You know, and finally, after a year, 10 years, you got it through. Why are you in this fix? You're in this fix as a politician because you're trying to politicize an issue that cannot be politicized. And, the, and you can't do anything about it. It's not as if better institutions or internet forums or politicians that are, who are less cynical or parties that have better appeals can solve this problem. This is a fundamental problem in in political science that everybody should learn in day one of American politics. Some issues are salient and some issues are not, and you cannot direct the voters towards salient issues. And one of the striking things about the EU in particular and international organizations in general is by and large, they do not handle salient issues. Therefore, if you want to democratize them, you have to democratize them indirectly via the nation states, via domestic politics, which will indirectly represent you not directly via referenda or even European parliamentary elections. It, you can't ever get a sensible result that way. I think that's a very deep and interesting insight because it tells us something about where we're going in the world, right? You cannot legitimate global governance by direct political participation. And that's going to cause a lot of problems in the future, but you're going to have to live with it and manage it. Okay, well, thank you again. And please join me.